Welcome, I'm Dr. Michael Hart. This is our first lecture in Political Science 101. Uh, it's called Politics and Political Science, an Introduction. Politics is about power. Harold Laswell, a famous American political scientist, defined politics as who gets what, when, and how. Politics is everywhere, so we say that it is ubiquitous, because power is everywhere. It is ubiquitous. Wherever there is more than one person, people enter into relations of power, whether they fully realize it or not. Political science is a social science, and a social science is an objective approach to the study of society. Political science studies power relations uh, in society. There are other social sciences, of course, in existence. Uh, they include sociology, anthropology, history, and even some areas of psychology. Political science is a derivative social science in that it relies on concepts, methods, and insights of other social sciences. Perhaps the only concept, or at least the only major concept, that is native to political science is the concept of power, and for the rest of the concepts we tend to rely on other social sciences. Whereas for their part, other social sciences rely less on political science than we rely on them. Power can, to a large degree, be measured. Sometimes it can only be measured indirectly. Power between two agents, and agents can be individuals, institutions, or countries, may be define, defined as the ability of agent A to make agent B act or refrain from acting regardless of B's wishes. This is a definition given to us by famous American political scientist Robert, Robert Dahl, who lived in the 20th century. A scientific approach heavily depends on the inductive method, and that includes observing facts, noticing patterns, and formulating educated guesses or hypotheses based on the patterns. Then the hypotheses that are formed can be repeatedly subjected to empirical testing. And those hypotheses that withstand the scrutiny of testing are called uh, general laws or theories. For example, we have the laws of Newton, laws of classical mechanics. There are three laws of motion and one law of gravity. These are just hypotheses that have been tested over and over again. And having stood testing, we elevate them to the status of laws. And then a general explanation or a framework for the laws can be called a theory. There are few genuinely scientific theories in social sciences and probably none in political science. This has to do with the inability to apply the experimental method to most social situations, especially most important and interesting social situations. So this is why social sciences are sometimes called soft sciences, as opposed to natural sciences that are called hard sciences, like physics, chemistry, and biology. Uh, but this should not mean that uh, social sciences are completely subjective. Quite contrary. Through the inductive method of systematic empirical observations, we have discovered many patterns that reveal much about how politics works in the real world. Correlations are not causations. So whenever we find correlations in social sciences, we must keep in mind that uh, these are simply mathematically expressed connections. They are not causations. So um, we cannot imply causations from correlations because we cannot control for intervening variables, not being able to use the experimental method. Now, what are the sources of power? In the real world, I argue we can identify at least four distinct sources of power. Power that comes from numbers, power that comes from financial or economic resources, personal power, and power of authority. At least these four sources of power. So numbers often will determine who wins and who loses. This is especially clear in institutional settings of democratic countries, 
like the House of Commons in the UK or Congress in the United States. Whoever has the majority, whichever side has the majority, is going to get its laws passed through that democratic legislative body. Even on the battlefield, if technology and the quality of generalship is more or less equal, then we can expect that numbers will often tell the difference between who wins and who loses. So clearly, numbers are very important, but they're not the only thing that's important in politics. We know this because we know that well-organized and uh, well-financed numerical minorities have a great deal of power, even in countries that are considered democratic countries. So organizations like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce or the Bis Business Roundtable, even though they do not include the majority of voters, certainly not, have a great deal of power because they can contribute money in every election cycle, millions and millions of dollars to different candidates of both major political parties for their political campaigns. We know that major corporations, because they employ a lot of people, have a great deal of impact on economic and social circumstances of the state and the country in which they're located. And therefore, by extension, politician will, politicians will listen to them. Because if major corporations are ignored, you may end up in a situation in which a lot of people are laid off, and then the economic misery that is brought on this way is going to be blamed on politicians. So if you hold the jobs of thousands or even millions of people in your hands as a corporation, you're going to have a lot of pull with the legislative authority of whichever country you're located in. There's also personal power. Some people just have a lot more energy, charisma, vision, and drive than others. Take someone like President Warren Harding, who was elected in 1920 and died uh, in the office of the president in 1924. Being president was probably the last job he should have had, but he had that job. Harding was spineless. He lacked vision. He lacked drive. And his administration, partly because of his personal weakness, was drowning in corruption. Whereas if you take somebody like Franklin Delano Roosevelt or his successor, uh, Harry Truman, their administrations were much less in, in corruption, especially that of Harry Truman. Harry Truman was basically incorruptible, and they had drive, dedication, and will that Warren Harding certainly did not have, and therefore they could accomplish things that Warren Harding could not. Personal power certainly is important. Next, we come probably to the most studied and the most significant source of power in modern societies today. That is the power of authority or institutional power. So institutional power is all about the ability to exercise power due to the fact that you belong to a particular institution. I can assign grades to my students. It's not because there's something special about me. It's not the result of, special, of some special personal power. And it's not the result of numbers. There's only one of me. And there's not economic or financial power involved here. It's because I'm employed by a, an institution uh, whose job it is to assign grades to students based on their academic performance. Or take somebody like Donald Trump. Donald Trump cannot propose laws to Congress, nor can he sign or veto laws passed by Congress, because he is not president of the United States. He was at one point, but he's not anymore. So he can't do it because he lacks the authority. He lacks the institutional power. I cannot get my students to wash my car, God knows it needs washing, but I can't do that because I do not have the institutional power to ask them to do that. Now, there are other sources of power, which I have here in brackets. 
knowledge and physical. Now, let me explain why I put them in brackets, because I believe these sources of power are not independent and always or almost always are attached to some other power, typically to the power of authority. You might have heard the expression, knowledge is power. Intuitively, it seems reasonable. If you know things that other people do not know, perhaps you can use them to your advantage, perhaps. Or perhaps you can just uh, use your knowledge to get a better job, or use your knowledge of where to travel, or where to stay, to get a more enjoyable vacation. That too is a power of sorts. Now, in the modern world, this type of power tends to be attached to uh, institutions like governments and their agencies because they can marshal a lot of human and computer resources to accumulate and process knowledge. Human beings are limited by their physical capacity, mostly by the physical capacity of their cranium because uh, a a human brain has to fit into, into a skull. And so we have very little knowledge accumulating and very little processing power. But an organization like the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, or the NSA, National Security Agency, can employ thousands of people and can have enormous computational resources so people come into organizations in order to combine their efforts. And when they combine their knowledge, then that knowledge really part of this artificial person called corporation or a security agency or whatever you call that institution. So it really is institutional power or power of authority. Physical power, too, when it is significant, tends to be associated with institutions like police departments or the National Guard or the military. So really significant physical power is not in the hands of one or two or three individuals. It really tends to be um, associated with institutions. Next, I want to talk about drivers of American politics. So there are multiple drivers of American politics, and I'm proposing at least three. You could perhaps extend this list. I'm not as certain that you could not. I am a certain, however, that at least these three have to be considered. First one is polarization. The difference between the two major parties and ideological differences between the people today are sharper than they have been in decades, perhaps sharper than they have been uh, in the last 55 years, you have to go back to the 1960s uh, to see a greater division. And some suggest even further back, perhaps to the 1860s. So different uh, socioeconomic, uh, different ethnocultural groups, different political parties are far apart in terms of their ideologies, their political worldviews today. And this cannot be a good sign for the country because it tends to uh, kind of pull the country in different directions. Uh, the next trend is internationalization of politics. If you look at American politics, almost every aspect of it is kind of closed with or, or intermingled with some sort of international aspect, whether it's immigration or education or trade. All of these aspects have a domestic facet and a, an international facet. And the last one I have is the disengagement of the young. Youngest voters, 18 to 29, vote at low rates and have less interest in politics than older voters. There may be different reasons for it, like some young people feel that they don't know enough about politics, so they're disengaged. Others uh, do not feel that political issues that are being discussed are relevant to them in any immediate way, so they just ignore politics as much as possible. 
Others may be idealistic and kind-hearted. And so uh, the uh, vicious and uh, the confrontational nature of politics turns, turns them off. And so they're just ignoring politics. And I think all of these reasons uh, are valid to, to some extent. The truth remains, though, that if a particular group, large group of voters, is disengaged, it means that politicians will not pay as much attention to them as to the groups that are engaged. So politicians will pay a lot more attention to senior citizens who are very interested in politics compared to the youngest voters as a group and who are very focused on two issues, Social Security and Medicare, because those two issues are highly relevant to their immediate circumstances. So uh, this, this might explain why Social Security accounts for roughly one-fifth of the federal spending, whereas spending on education is about 1% of all spending. So politicians understand how their bread is buttered, and they pay attention to those who uh, hold their fate, their career, uh, in, in their hands. So this was my basic introduction to politics and political science. Thank you, and uh, we'll see you in the next one.